God, thanks for the day. Thanks for the chance to worship today. Thanks for the chance to gather as a family today. Thank you that you have given us this place to worship in, and we, we bless you for that. And we pray right now, Father, you would just open up our minds and our hearts to, uh, to you, uh, to your word, and to not only what you would say to us, but what you would want us to do with what you have to say to us today. So just, uh, I pray that you would just help us to prepare our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're very fortunate that uh, today we have a, a visitor come all the way from Montreal, Quebec. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's not a first-time visitor, but uh, but we had Scott. We have Scott with us. He's been with us uh, since Thursday, and uh, he's been uh, visiting with Anna and I, and then with Rob and Julie, and he's been helping us, well, helping us particular uh, with uh, with some of our mission stuff. And then he was uh, he was with us at the ordination service last night, which was a real blessing to have you here, Scott. And uh, so uh, Scott just can't be in a church setting without having something to say. So, so we love Scott. <laughs> we love Scott, so we're going to give him a chance to have something to say. Alors, merci, Gordon. Enchanté d'être avec vous ce matin. Is Claire here? No, she's not here today. Okay. Anyway, great time last night. I, I always love coming down here. It never takes Rob, Pastor Rob, more than an hour to start saying to me, like, you really need to move down here. And when it's this weather, he's, you know, saying, it's, it's like this all year round. <laughs> and I look at him and say, you are fabricating. That is not true. But it was great to hit the beach Friday, so it wasn't all, quote, work. Uh, but good to be with you. I have seen this church grow from your very first meeting in uh, Easter 2005. I remember it very, very well. It was a great time. A lot fewer people, obviously. And to come down two, three times a year, I just want to encourage you and say it's, it's exciting what's going on here. It is truly exciting. I remember Cliff as a, a young man eight years ago. Uh, and Sherry, Sherry was here. I don't know where Sherry is now, but you know, she responded to, to Jesus inviting her to come and... and, and and, and Cliff just kind of watching and thinking, what's happening? And now Cliff, now Cliff is leading things. <laughs> and he's going to be teaching in a couple of weeks, so it's great. Anyway, this church is part of a movement of churches called the Baptist General Conference. We have about 115 churches coast to coast, mainly, however, in the west from, say, Thunder Bay West. Uh, so any major metropolitan area from Thunder Bay, Winnipeg, Edmonton, Calgary, Regina, Saskatoon, we have churches, plus many, many rural churches and then churches in Vancouver area, et cetera. But we've just been growing in the east in the last, really the last 20-some years. Like I went to Quebec as a church planter. We started a church similar to this one, although smaller. And that is now being pastored, by the way, by a young man, a Timothy, that we reached He's 34 years old. He came to Christ under our ministry. We baptized him and married him, and now he's pastoring the church that we started. And that's the type of passing on that we want to see happen and that I mentioned even last night. And we really do want to help you on your mission to Honduras. So in uh, mid-October, our uh, movement of churches, we meet every year, and at this time will be mid-October in Winnipeg. So we're not going there because it's in Winnipeg. Sorry, Rob, you lived there for what, 12 years. Uh, but we're meeting there and you guys are coming out, both Gordon and Anna. They will speak to all the pastors and churches present and we're going to encourage them to partner with the McKenzie's. Partnering in prayer, partnering in financial help, plus you're staying on. And this is what we've been working on the past, past couple of days is we want to get Gordon and Anna into 10, 15 churches in the Winnipeg area and just uh, maybe two, three hours outside the city to present the future mission in Honduras. And we're just praying that God is going to have churches step up to bat, step up to the plate, and say, we want to be part of that. And so you need to be as well asking that God is going to not only raise people in this church to help send them out six or eight months from now, but that the whole movement we would be also behind them. And so, yes, that is a major part of what I want to do to help them. So it's great to be with you today and a great time last night. Thank you to everyone who, who was there and participated. I think it was very, very meaningful for, for everyone. So thank you.
Thanks, Scott. Thanks for coming down. Thanks for uh, in investing in our church, too. We took Scott out to Martinique Beach uh, on Friday trying to teach him how to surf. We rented a couple of surfboards, and uh, <coughs> it was a fun experience. <coughs> we did have a great time last night uh, for Gordon's ordination. Uh, and uh, really what we did was we took a whole bunch of different types of gatherings, and we put them into one. Uh, one is an ordination uh, council, which is normally a bunch of pastors that come together and throw theological questions at you to see, uh, check out your theological competency. And, and yet, we didn't do that as a council of pastors, we did that as a church. And, but uh, I know that we had tons of questions that you didn't all get a chance to ask. I, I had a whole list of theological questions I would have loved to throw in a corn. Um, get, get the chance to do that. You still have the opportunity to do that. You can just come up to them any time saying, well, Gordon, what do you think about... And throw those questions at them. Um, but the other part that we did was we just gave people the opportunity to feedback, uh, which to me is even maybe more of an important aspect of, uh, Gordon, here's how you've had impact as a pastor in my life or in our lives as a church. And uh, just hearing stories from you guys just saying what the influence was. Now, some of you have had uh, Gordon invest into your life, uh, but you didn't get a chance to say that last night. Um, and maybe you've never made any comment back to him to let him know that he's had an impact in your life. And what we simply want to say is, why don't you just, over this next week or so, even write a card or just come up to him personally and talk and say, Gordon, you may be unaware of this, but you've had this type of impact in my life. And, and to me, that really affirms your calling for ministry and this whole idea of ordination. And you might want to do that. Then we had, uh, usually you have that sort of gathering of the pastors. You might have a time of congregational sharing. And then you have a separate time, which is sort of an ordination service where you've got a speaker and worship. Well, we, we had Scott speak last night as far as an ordination service goes. And, and so uh, we, we took three events and pack them into one, but it was a good night, and, uh, and uh, thank you to all of you who came, and, and so, anyways, we are now in the middle of a series called Stop Talking. Last week we said, you know, I want you to stop talking and just listen to God. Now, even in your prayer, sometimes it's just, we find it, we come to God and we tell God what we think he should do, and maybe we just need to stop telling God what he should do and just ask God. God, what do you want me to do? How do you want to be at work in my life? And, and just start listening and, and going to Scripture and finding from Scripture how God speaks to you and what he wants you to do and through prayer and through counsel of wisdom of others and things like that. What we want to move into today is a Scripture verse. Uh, that it's, it's really simple. It comes from James chapter 1, verses 19. Uh, it says, My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Now, my guess is that the chances are in this room this morning, some of you probably got into an argument in this past week. Is that possibly true? You've either, you personally involved, or maybe you were just even watching an interaction going on. And I, I mean, I was watching an interaction go on the street where, where two people just started yelling at each other, and, and you could see the physical body language, just they're going rigid and tense, and, and this sort of interaction going on, saying, oh, this could go really well. <laughs> and maybe you've watched that happen, and you just observed neither of them were listening to each other. Both of them just had their point that they just want to get across and they want to pound it into the other person. And chances are, if you've had a little bit of a tense dialogue in this past week, you know that feeling. The other person needs to hear something. The other person needs to hear something from you. There's something they need to hear to set them right, to set them in their place, to, to, to correct something that's wrong in their thinking, and you just want to sort of drive it home, and you've got that point that you want to express, and when they throw something back, you realize, well, they're not getting it, so I've got to do it even more forcefully, and your voice starts to raise, and you get a little bit more animated. Is that true? Could that possibly ever happen? You know, what I find for myself is that the reason this passage here is in the Bible that says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, is because I do precisely the opposite. All right? I, I'm slow to listen in my natural state. That's me. 
Um, I, I don't really want to listen. I just want to tell you what you should think. And so I'm then quick to speak. And if I'm quick to speak and you don't quite still get it and you're resistant, then I become quick to anger. Right? That's my natural way of going about things. If I'm not... If I'm not restrained, if I'm tired, if I'm exhausted, that's me. The question you've got to ask yourself is, is that you too? Is that the natural you? Is that how you get caught? Now, some of you maybe have different ways, and maybe it doesn't always come out in the same way, but maybe on the inside, you're still not quick to listen. Even as the other person's talking, you're already forming arguments in your head. And even though you might not blurt it out, you want to, but you're just a little bit restrained. And inside, you can feel that little tension rising. So it always doesn't express itself in the same way, but you experience it. And so I guess the question is that I want us thinking through today if we adopted simply this one verse of the Bible, one incredibly simple verse of the Bible, that's not telling you anything new. This isn't brilliant insight stuff. But it's a reminder that if you just simply this week determined, I am going to be quick to listen, I'm going to be slow to speak, and I'm going to be really slow to anger, if you determine to approach every relationship this week that way, do you think it might affect your relationships in some way? Do you might think it might affect how you relate to your boss or to your employees or to your coworkers? Do you think it might affect how you relate to a parent? Because youth, children, this is for you too. Do you think it might affect how you relate to your parents? Parents, do you think it might affect how you relate to your children? It might affect how we relate just to anybody. Especially a person that we already have attention with. I want you thinking through that, how this scripture might impact your life. And I'll invite the worship team to come on up. And lead us. Sometimes we get into conversations with people and we, uh, we're thinking in the back of our head, how in the world could you be saying what you are saying and thinking what you're thinking? Or, or some are in counseling sessions where the person says, I, I just don't understand that person. I just don't understand them. And I go, precisely. And then they'll go on saying, well, I do understand. I said, no, 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 get back to your original statement. You don't really understand why they're saying what they're saying. And this is what's creating some of the tensions. And, uh, and I, like, literally, like, people say, like, are you crazy? And what they're saying is, what you're saying, you're expressing, it just comes across as complete nonsense. And, and that's what we think about other people, too. And, and, and how is that possible that, that we can be in a, in a relationship and just not completely understand where that person's coming from. But then when they speak on an issue, it, it, it has special impact on us if it in some way affects my personal agenda. So in other words, if you and I have a decision, I really want to accomplish this, but you're bringing in this idea, and your idea would sort of keep us from getting there and would veer us in this direction, well, then that creates a tension for me because I really feel I need to be over here for life to be good and for life to be complete and full of joy and peace, and you're keeping me from getting from to where I feel I need to go. Sometimes it's, uh, it can e evoke our sense of justice, that what you're doing is wrong, and you've wronged me, or you've wronged this over here. And you need to see that what you're doing is wrong. And, and so it evokes that sense of justice in us, and that, then that anger comes out. But it especially impacts us if it attacks in some way our sense of worth. That you're in a dialogue with someone, and they're maybe attacking an issue or something, but you feel 
you feel like they're attacking your value and your worth. And then suddenly what happens is defenses go up. Defenses go up where you don't even hear more. Isn't it interesting? Have you ever had this happen to you? Where you have a tense argument with someone about some issue, but then anything that they say from that point on, on any topic, on any issue, you have a barrier with them. Isn't that interesting? You might have had a tension over both this thing, but you're going to carry that tension into this conversation, into this conversation, into this conversation. You're going to have a tension about this over here, but even if you walk into a room like this, you're, you're going to part to different sides of the room. Isn't that because we have our defenses up. And our defenses saying, I'm going to keep myself from getting hurt. I'm going to keep myself from being sidetracked from where I need to go. I, I, it's all defenses. So the question is, how do we change? How do we approach it differently? And it's, all I simply want to do is, <laughs> let's go with the scripture verse. Let's see what it has to say. So this whole thing about being quick to listen. Well, the reason that we're slow to listen, or that we, or I guess maybe it's better said, the reason we need to be quick to listen is there's obviously two different perspectives at work. We've got the same circumstance, but two different perspectives. Let me illustrate this in this way. I, I, I'm going to put an image up on the screen here, and I want you just to tell me what you see. Let, let's put the first image up. What do you see? How many of you, the first thing you saw was a person? How many, the first thing you saw was the word liar? Oh, we got a little bit of attention going on here. Who's right? <laughs> Rita's right. <laughs> you know, you see, sometimes you can be looking at the same thing and seeing two different things, and, and suddenly that's what creates the tension. If I was to have you come up and have a discussion about what you see, uh, I, need to, uh, um, I need just some two people to here to help me out here. Um, just two volunteers. Okay, Ralph, Ralph, come on up here. Ralph, I want you to just come up by the table here. I, I need one other person. Uh, Rita, Rita, can you go and stand at the very back? <laughs> <laughs> just, I just want you standing here at the table. And so, no, back a little bit further. Yeah, right back by Russell there. Okay. So what I want to do is I just, I just want to put up an image, and I, I just want you to tell me what you see. So, so, Ralph, you turn around, and you tell me what you see. Let's put the image up here. Who do you see there? Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein. Is that who you see back there? Uh, no. <laughs> Who do you see back there? Marilyn Monroe, Albert Einstein. Um, who's right? Do you see Marilyn Monroe? From my perspective, I'm right. From your perspective, you're right. It's, you don't see Marilyn Monroe at all there. You see Albert Einstein. And you don't see Albert Einstein. See, isn't this interesting? There's two individuals looking at the exact same image. And now we could get into an argument as to who is right. You can go back to your seats. How many of you see Albert Einstein? How many of you see Marilyn Monroe? <laughs> Those of you that see Albert Einstein, squint your eyes. Now, here's the thing. If you're up close, you'll see Albert Einstein. Uh, put the big image up. Squint your eyes. Now, sometimes we get into these circumstances where we're talking about the same thing, the same situation, but we start arguing about it because we're coming at it from two different perspectives. Let's put up the next slide here. And what you'll see here, uh, oh, well, oh, I forgot I even had that one. Uh, um, what do you see? This is an old one. How many of you, the first thing you see is a young woman? How many of you see an old woman? Yeah, you could be starting to argue it through. Yeah. You, you see it? I mean, that's an old one. I think most of you have probably seen this one. This next one really intrigues me. Go uh, here to the next slide. You've got a slide A and a slide, uh, a square A and a square B. 
If you were to describe square A, not the letter, but the actual square and the color of it, how would you define the color of square A versus the color of square B? Square A is dark, black. Square B is light. Okay, I disagree with all of you. They're the exact same color. I'm telling you that they're the exact same color. Do you agree with me? Well, you're wrong. And I'm right. So there. Now, do you really want to continue debating this? <laughs> I'm telling you they're not the same. I'm, not telling, I'm telling you they're not diff two different colors. I'm telling you they're the exact same color. No, I'm telling you they're the exact same color. Should we split our church over this? You guys are so deceived, I don't feel I can talk to you anymore. You guys are so blinded, so unclued to what's really... <laughs> Show me the next slide, please. Slide B and slide A are the exact same. I cut out slide square B. I slid it up beside slide A. If you go into power, um, um, into um, what's Photoshop, and you take your little eyedropper, and you read the RGB colors of the red, green, and blue, and you put it on the square A, and you get the colors, coordinates, and you then go to square B, and you get, you'll have the exact same RGB colors, not even a hint differently. They are the exact same color. Go back to the previous slide. I'm right, you're wrong. <laughs> you know, but this is what can happen, not just in visual illusions. This is what happens in real life. Let's put up the next slide. We can be looking at one sculpture, and depending on where I place you, one of you is going to see a deer, another is going to see a blob, another one is going to see an eagle. One sculpture, as you walk around, from three different angles, you will see three different things. These are really cool sculptures. I wish I could actually find where to buy one. Um, Fascinating, uh, incredible artistry to, to make this happen. But you understand that if I had one of you over here, you would be arguing, arguing vehemently that it was a deer. And the other person that was saying it was an eagle over there uh, would be arguing with you saying, what's wrong with you? What's your problem? What's the issue? You've obviously got issues if you can't see the deer or if you can't see the eagle or the other person. I don't see what either of you are talking about. It's just, you know... But when dealing with people, it's important, before we start arguing our point, is to start listening to why they have the perspective they have. You know, you guys could start arguing about square A and B, but before you start arguing that too vehemently, wouldn't you want to know why I say that they were the same color? Because maybe there's something that I can bring to the table that, because there's a reason why I'm saying they're the same color. Obviously, it looks like two different colors, but there must be a reason why I'm saying it's the same color. Now, it could be that I'm colorblind. But even colorblind people can see shades, right? So there must be some reason why I would be arguing they were the same color. And instead of just taking your standpoint saying, no, they're clearly different, Maybe it's just a time to start asking questions. Maybe start listening. Because uh, maybe there's some insights that the other person has that you have not yet considered. Maybe there's uh, more to the picture that, that, that you aren't necessarily seeing. I sort of think of it this way. That here's the situation, and that... In any given circum situation, no one has the full truth necessarily. When we come to counseling situations, any one person that comes to me to, in a counseling situation that um, is in a relationship tension with another person, I automatically know that they're lying. Now, I don't use the word lying, because it's not really lying, but I know that I'm not getting the full picture. It's impossible for me to get the full picture. 
Because I'm hearing a scenario from one person's point of view. Now, that person might have uh, like this, this much perspective, and the other person might only have this per much perspective. The question is, how do you know which one you are until you get into dialogue? What I may discover as I start to listen to in your, your rationale, you say, as you listen to me and say, well, guys, actually, those two squares are actually the same color. This is just a, an optical illusion that's tricking your eye where it's anticipating patterns. And, and we're tricking your mind to think that there's a color pattern going on there, which isn't really going on there. It's just a trick of the mind. And so as, but if you understand that the color values of this square are the exact same color values of that square, and I'll even prove it by taking that one square and sliding it up beside, then you start to realize, oh, I thought I had truth. I thought I had the full picture. I thought the, that, that chart, that checkerboard that I was looking at seemed to be an authentic checkerboard. But as I come in and I start to give you a bigger picture, you realize that you only had a small piece of the picture. You didn't have all the information. Now, had we not had a discussion, you would have stood firm on your perspective. I would have stood firm on my perspective. Now, sometimes, so I go into a conversation thinking I've got the bigger picture, and it's only through talking to the other person that I realize, oh, they actually have more information that I was unaware of, and I actually really only have a small piece of the information. But how do you figure that out? You only figure that out when you stop to ask questions. And the problem is, is that when we can come back to this, this tension, we usually assume that we have the right information. That's our natural starting point. We assume that the perspective we have is the right perspective. That's why you have it. We used to have a joke in the last church that uh, I was at where um, I think one person made this comment. Uh, it was either to me or to the senior pastor, probably me. They said, well, you just think you're right. I said, yes. <laughs> um, I usually don't go around thinking things I think are wrong. Right? All of you think you're right. Otherwise, you're kind of foolish. What? You're going to hold on to something that you think is wrong? You're going to believe something you think is wrong? No, you, what you think is right. With the information that you have, with the perspective you have, the stand that you're taking, you believe is right. Because you've got a certain amount of information. And because of that, usually we're slow to, slow to, uh, to listen. Why would I need to listen to you if I've got the right information? But if I start to consider that maybe I don't have all the information, simply the fact that another person has another perspective should say something to me. That, that obviously even now with this one issue, they're viewing it from one angle. They're seeing it in a way that's different than what I'm seeing it. And until I can understand why they're seeing it the way they do, I will never be able to resolve a tension between us because we're both going to think that we're right. And neither of us are going to listen. So maybe the wise person is the person that says, okay, I'm assuming here that I've got the bulk of the right information. But for a moment, I'm going to give the other person the benefit of the doubt. And I'm going to listen to hear what they have to say because they obviously have a perspective that I don't have. They're obviously seeing something that I'm not seeing. They're obviously seeing something at work here that's making them think that position is right. And I at least need to hear that because maybe they are right. Maybe they have something can, to contribute. Or maybe what you discover is both of you are just in the middle and both of you are equally deceived. And maybe that there's a full, fuller picture that needs to be seized on here. The only way that you do that is by thinking it is possible, as remotely possible as it may seem, it is possible that that person has some valuable insights that I could learn from. And I'm going to actually... I'm actually going to take the time to listen to the person. And you know what that listening does? When I say, instead of me just forcing my perspective on you and pushing my opinions on you and my expectations on you, I'm just going to stop and I'm going to listen to you. 
I'm not going to interrupt. I'm not going to start arguing. As you're talking, I'm not going to be formulating my arguments in my head as how I can beat down what you're saying. I'm actually going to truly listen to you and what you have to say. And I think I've shared before, there was once I was, um, I was standing in a room um, at a college, it was just a college lounge area, and, and I was talking to this one lady, and she was the type of lady that when she talked to you, no one else existed. Her eyes just bored into you. She listened to every word. She might have even got a little bit uncomfortably close. <laughs> but you knew that she was listening to everything you had to say. She shut out everything else going around her. You were the only person that existed in the world. And you know what that did? It just conveyed incredible value. Isn't that amazing that I could remember that one brief 60-second conversation from over 25 years ago? Isn't that interesting? I've had many conversations. But one one-minute conversation, might have been a bit longer, but I, and I, you know what, I don't even remember her name. I don't remember what we were talking about. I don't remember what the issue was. I just remembered simply the way a person listened to me, hit home value to me, and it, it, it changed everything to the point where I even remember that conversation from, I'm assuming, 25 years ago or sometime. You know what? Wouldn't it be neat if each of us was that type of listener? If we could convey that type of value. But you know what? It's just a wise thing to do. When you just jump in and you start giving your, your input without listening to the other person, do you know what the Bible calls you? A fool. Look at this verse. Proverbs 18, 13. He who answers before listening, that is his folly and his shame. <laughs> Have any of us done that in the past week? Have we answered before listening? Yeah. Someone says something, and before we stop to find out why they're saying what they're saying, we already are attacking it or diminishing it in some way. Proverbs 4.1. Listen, my sons and daughters, to a father's and mother's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. Uh, you know what it's saying over here is when it comes to parent-child relationships, it's say, like, kids, it's a smart thing to listen to your parents. Yeah, they're not always going to be right, but the chances are they've got this much information from their life experience, and you and your life experience have this much information. So the Bible tells kids when your parents say something, Listen to it. Listen to it and gain understanding. Doesn't mean they're always right, but listen to them. Uh, Proverbs 12, 15, it says, The way of a fool seems right to him, but a wise man listens to advice. <laughs> Every time we see a person veer off in a wrong direction, it's usually not because wise people have not counseled them against it, it's usually because they've chosen to ignore the counsel of the wise people. And in all my years of ministry, in working with youth, working with children, and working with adults, most of the time that we've seen people veer off is because they chose not to listen to wise counsel or chose not to seek out at all any wise counsel. They just said, I'm making this decision, I'm going this way. And it's like, ooh, that's not going to be good. And it's usually not good. But it says in Proverbs 15, 31, he who listens to a life-giving rebuke will be at home among the wise. See, sometimes when what the person has to say to me is a criticism or a, an area where I need to change my life or that I'm failing or... or not measuring up, or I'm doing something that's destructive, and that person then speaks into my life, boy, my defenses go up even extra fast, because now you're attacking my, my ability, my adequacy, my, my worth, if my worth is attached to my performance. And defenses go up pretty quickly then, don't they? And yet, what the Bible says is, 
the wise person, when someone comes up to you to talk to you about an issue in your life, they may not always phrase it in the most loving way. They might not phrase it in the most tactful way. And it may come across as an assault, but the wise person still listens to what is being said and considers it and then responds accordingly. Because even my enemy, even someone who doesn't have my best interest in mind, can still have truth to speak into my life that I need to consider. And I need to listen. So as I'm listening, I don't want to interrupt them. The goal isn't that they simply even feel heard. The goal is that they are heard. You see, sometimes uh, people have felt that I've done this because uh, at times um, when it's in intense circumstances, I make the commitment, I'm going to go in and I'm going to listen. But that's not a natural conversation, is it? That's not what we're used to. So sometimes if you have attention with me and, and I sit there and I just listen and I listen because I've already prepared my mind. I'm just going to listen and I'm going to hear, hear, hear. Sometimes it almost comes across as artificial. And they're saying, well, this isn't really you. This is, well, no, it's not the real me because you don't really want the real me. <laughs> you want the godly me. And I'm trying to be the godly me right now. <laughs> And so, so I know the godly me may be abnormal and not what you naturally experience, but I'm working hard at the godly me right now. So let's go with it. <laughs> and, and, but see, the goal isn't just that they even just feel heard. I need to actually know that they are heard. I, it, I need to truly actually hear them. I just don't want them to think that they're being heard. I actually really do want to hear you. And I do want to hear what you have to say. And I, but I need to have that in my mind. That means I've got to drop my defenses. I've got to drop my pride. I've got to choose to be humble and humbly accept what you're saying and listen and, and consider what's being said. And, um, and then the way that I know that I've listened is that I feed it back to you. Say, so can, can I just let me see if I'm getting this right. The tension that you're experiencing with Reem right now is that you feel that I am doing da 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 and it's, and it's sort of impacting you this way. And um, is, that, is that, do you think I've, am I hearing you right on that? And they'll either say, well, no, you're missing this. Like, okay, okay, so what you're saying is this, but in addition to that, you're also feeling da 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 da. Say, so, yes, that's it. Okay, and because of that, yeah, you know what? If I thought that's, if, if, if someone was coming to me in that same way, I'd feel the exact same way as you. So can I just first of all say this? I apologize for coming across that way. Because that would be wrong. I don't want to come across that way. That's not my heart intent. That's not where. But you know, I just need to be able to communicate to them, is this what you're saying? And for them saying, yes, that's what I'm saying. And until I'm sure I hear them, I will not go further in the conversation. Because I need to, I, I need to know what we're talking about. So... Once that happens, then I need to hear them. And you know what? I've got to be honest. Sometimes that just resolves things right there. Because I realize, oh, okay, I wasn't aware that it was coming across. I didn't realize that I was having that impact or, or, or that, or, you know, I did do that over there. And I was completely insensitive to you. You know what? I just, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. But, but you know what it does? It, it expands my understanding. And sometimes I get saying, you're right. You're absolutely right. And <laughs> good, but we don't need to go any further. Sometimes, though, Scripture says then you need to still speak. It's not just listening. You still need to speak. But when you speak, speak slowly. Does that mean I talk like this? No, it means that before I speak, I consider my words very carefully. Uh, because whatever I say back to you, will either bring calmness and peace and a hope for resolution, or it's going to raise the tension higher. It's going to have one of two effects. It's not going to be neutral. It's either going to aggravate, or it's going to bring peace. And you know what? If I go in with this tension, if I go in with the idea mindset that I'm right, and that you need to hear what I have to say, guess what my words are going to accomplish? It's going to escalate, isn't it? Have any of you ever been in a conversation where the tension escalated because of something you said? No? Just... Oh, yeah. 
Why is that? It's because simply you did not consider what the other person needed to hear from you at that point in time. You were considering what you felt needed to be said to crush their argument, but you were not considering, first of all, you probably hadn't listened to them. And because they weren't listened to, they probably weren't willing yet to listen to you. See, if you listen to someone attentively and, you, and they know that you're hearing them and you care about them and you're conveying that value to them, then when it's time for you to speak, guess what the chances are they'll probably do back to you? Listen. But if you find that when you say something that it escalates, it's probably one because, one, you haven't really listened. Secondly, that when you do speak, you're not speaking wisely. You're speaking words still just to support your case, but you're not considering how they need to hear those words, how those words need to be presented. And what, what God's telling us through, through this passage is, when it's saying, be slow to speak, it says, measure your words very carefully. Consider, when I say this, what impact do I expect it to have? Will this actually calm things down and move us towards resolution, or will this aggravate Things. And um, there have been times when I've gone into conversations and I've blown it. <laughs> I've had people take swings at me. We get into attention. I remember working in a group home with, with uh, senior high kids. I remember being at this, uh, at the, this one kid was being really defiant and things weren't going well. We had to go to the school and for, I don't even remember what the issue was, but I remember just uh, being in conversation with this kid and he said something, I said something back and realized, ooh, that was the wrong thing to say back. And it just escalated the kid and he just took his arm, he swung and missed me. <laughs> but, but, you know, it was um, sometimes my pride wants to use words to attack back and put the other person in their place. But I can guarantee you, as soon as you do that, you've just taken that conversation down a few notches in effectiveness and towards resolution. Proverbs 12, 18 says this, Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. What does a person need from me right now? One, they need me to remain calm and consider what they have to say. It's not an artificial calmness. It's a gubby calmness rooted in, I'm really interested in what you have to say right now. I want to hear it from your perspective. Because maybe I'm calling the square black or white when it's really the other color. You know, we got in the heated debate over black and white squares. You know, that could split our church. And yet, wouldn't it be nice just to listen to find out what's really going on? What the other person needs is to be calm. And what the other person doesn't need you to do is start accusing them. Do you find that this happens? Now, I'm going to say it this way because it will be easier for you to listen. Do you find that sometimes when you go to talk to someone about an issue in their life, suddenly they find an issue in your life? Right, that they want to talk about? It's, it's their way of sort of deflecting and defense. My defense goes up, and the way the best defense is the deflect. And so I deflect the conversation back onto you about your issues. Because as long as we're talking about my issues, I don't have to talk you know. Now, you, you've experienced that with other people, right? Now, have other people experienced that with you? Now, that's the stinging one. And you think, oh, no, no, I don't do that. But if I was to come to you right now, or if someone else was to come up to you, or let's say a family member was to come up to you, or a co-worker was to come up to you and to talk to you about an issue in your life, what would be your natural response? Would you find it very quick and natural to start finding something wrong with your life? Oh, yeah, you're judging me. You're condemning me. Well, what about you? And it's easy to start pointing fingers at the other person because that's how we protect ourselves, right? That's how I protect my worth, my identity, my performance, is I find faults with you. And I'm okay compared to you. <laughs> You know, and what Scripture's saying is, that's not slow talking. That's not wise talking. That's pride talking. That's hurt talking. And hurt and pride do not heal relationships. Humility, love, grace heals relationships. And that's what we want to keep working towards here. You know what? If you are being quick to listen and you're being slow to speak, guess what's going to happen on the anger front? If you're quick to listen and you're slow to speak, you will be slow to anger. Uh, that's just going to be a natural outflow. If I'm uh, slow to listen 
and I'm quick to speak, guess what's going to rise up in me pretty quickly? Because if I'm slow to listen and I'm quick to speak, I can already tell you the conversation's not going well, and the other person's not going to be responding well, and their tension's going to be rising, and as their tension rises, and they start seeing back, my tension's rising. I can guarantee you, if I'm slow to listen and quick to speak, that I'm going to be quick to anger, and it's just going to go all downhill from there. And that's not the type of relationship God wants you to have with anybody. So usually anger, by the time anger comes, anger is usually evoked when I'm being deprived of something. I'm being deprived of justice. I'm being deprived of love and acceptance. I'm being deprived of respect. Uh, or I'm being deprived of accomplishing my goals, my agenda. And so anger is my defense mechanism to find a fault in you, a failure in you, and to condemn you because in some weird, perverted, twisted way, that makes me feel better about who I am. And there is such a thing as a righteous anger, but most of us don't have to worry about that. Let's not worry about the righteous anger. Let's just deal with our anger, because really our anger, our sinful anger, is, uh, it's got to be 99.5% of the anger that we experience. We'll declare it a just anger. We'll declare it a righteous anger. That is because we've got a deceived perspective. We don't have the full picture of what's going on. And when I get angry then, and I'm judging you, and I'm declaring you guilty, then I have to dole out a punishment to you, and that punishment is either going to be in some way an attack. That could be verbal, it could be physical, emotional, or manipulative, whatever it is. It could be subtle, it could be overt, but in some way I'm going to attack to tear you down. Or I'm going to withdraw, and the withdrawal could be silence, it could be ignoring you, it could be just not loving you. And i, I got to let you know, it says in James 1.20, in 21, it says, For a man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of it. Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent and humbly accept the word, of God, word planted in you, which can save you. You see, when I'm judging you, uh, it's my sinful sense of worth and performance that's trying to be defended, and i got to tear you down to protect myself. And God's saying, yeah, that's not how I do things. And, by the way, that won't take you to a very pleasant place in your life. And you know what? As long as you carry that anger around in you, you are trapped. Because you are going to keep reliving that hurt and that pain over and over and over again. How many of you are still angry for something someone said and did to you decades ago? How many of you are still wounded by that and holding on to that bitterness and that hurt because of what happened to you decades ago? Well, it's not affecting them. All it's doing is affecting you because you're trapped to it. You're still judging that person for what they did wrong. And as because you're judging them, you're still having to relive the, the, the crime. You're having to relive the guilty sentence that you're passing on them. And you've got to keep handing out the punishment of anger uh, through uh, attack or withdrawal, whatever it is, condemnation. You've got to keep doling that out to keep your sense of justice going. And as you keep go that going out, you are constantly bound to that offense. And you can never be free from that offense. And you'll carry that offense with you till the day you die as long as you continue to judge. And God's saying, stop judging other people. Instead of judging them, here's what he says in Luke 6, 27. But I tell you, you who hear me, and he's only speaking to those that are willing to listen to this, he says, love your enemies. Instead of judging and condemning and giving your enemies the consequence you think they deserve, he says, don't do that. That's none of your business. You are not the judge. It is not your job to judge your enemies. That's God's job, and he says, I'll take care of that, and I'll do a far better job than you will. And he says, I'll also give a far more serious uh, penalty than you will. So leave the justice to me, God would say. And then we say, well, then what's my job? If my job's not to judge, he says, well, your job's simply then to represent my love and grace and compassion to those people that would want to hurt you and wound you and offend you. And he says, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Man. Simple stuff, isn't it? It's simple. Incredibly, incredibly simple. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. If we could just get this down. 
if we could just get this down, it would revolutionize our church. It would revolutionize your life. It would change your relationships. It doesn't control the other person. You can't determine what the other person would do. But I can guarantee you, on a big scale of things, all people want to know is that they're listened to and that they're heard. People don't even need to be right. They just need to be listened to. And you know, there's going to be times when we come to a situation, and, and this happens occasionally, where we've got a situation, and I'm coming in, and I've got this perspective. The other person comes in, they've got their perspective. But you know what? I still listen to them, and I hear why they're having their perspective. They listen to me, and they hear why I've got my perspective, and we still choose to disagree. But you know what? In that type of environment, we can still get up and hug each other at the end of the conversation because we've conveyed value to the other person. And I make sure, guys, that when I'm in a tense relationship with someone, when I'm arguing with someone or whatever happens, that the thing that's running through my mind is value the person more than the issue. Value the person more than the issue. It, even though we may end up disagreeing, I want this person to know that I love them, I care about them, and I want what's best for them. And at the end of this conversation, as they walk away, Regardless of what conclusion we came to, I at least want them to walk away saying, Rob cares. That's what I want. Am I always successful at that? No. But that's what I want. And I hope that that's what you want too. And I know relationships are tough. And so what I'm going to ask and encourage you to do is, why don't you this week try and remember simply these three points. In every conversation... I will be quick to listen. I will be slow to speak. I will slow to become angry. And I will try and represent God well here. And I want this person to know that I love them and care about them. It doesn't matter what relationship it is. You know, if God's uh, prompting you in some way, you may want to write an action step. Because sometimes when uh, it comes now to God wanting me to be slow to speak, sometimes... Part of that speaking is maybe he needs me to go and ask for forgiveness. Maybe it's going to someone saying, hey, I got a sense that you're um, having some tension with me. Could we get together and talk about that? And maybe there is a little bit more information I can give. Because you know what? Most relationship tensions are simply misunderstandings. They really are. I honestly have to say at least 80% of the tensions that I deal with in between people 80% of them are just misunderstandings. If they just heard each other and if they understood what's going on, the tension wouldn't have even been there in the first place. So instead of letting anger rise, why don't you just go and ask questions? Questions before anger. Is that a good way of thinking it? I will not allow any tension or anger arise in my life until I ask good, caring questions. Questions before anger. Maybe God wants you to do something this week in response to this. In which case, you may want to write an action step on here. In which case, if you put your email address, we'll email it back to you midweek just to remind you. Maybe you've got a prayer request saying, yeah, I've, I've got to work through some, some tough uh, relationships. Uh, would you just be praying that God would give me wisdom and the loving, tactful words to say and the ability to listen? Uh, whatever it is, you may just want to write something on your card and hand in. At the end of the service, your cards can just stay on your seats. Or you, if it's confidential, you can put them. There will be a basket at the back, and you just put them in the basket uh, that we'll be holding at the back of the congregation. And um, why don't I just pray for you as the worship team comes. Father, I pray for me. <laughs> Lord, I need to be slow to, I need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Lord, I know especially at times when I'm tired and I've got less energy or I'm not feeling well, oh boy, that stuff just seems to go out the window. But Lord, I just pray that you would, um, for each of us here, would your Holy Spirit prompt us to remind us Quick to listen, quick to listen, quick to listen. Would your Holy Spirit just do that? Would those words ring in our ears as we engage with people this week? Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. And Father, may that change how we relate to people. May it change even our testimony. May people as they see us start to see you. May we represent you in how we relate to others in this coming week. And may people be drawn to you simply because of how we show your love. We need your help in this. In Jesus' name.